Okay, perfect. This is a case-based presentation. And uh, to the faculty, please feel free to interrupt me at any time. I think that uh, uh, these uh, patients with the bamboo-like spine, which is a rigid spine, at, at the same time um, vulnerable to fracture after minor impact. They possess uh, real challenges to most of us. So let, let's get started uh, with this case. Uh, he is a 48 years year old man with history of ankylosis spondylitis as that was transferred to our department from, from coming from another country. And he has the diagnosis of cervical fracture after minor trauma. Uh, this really happened like uh, five years ago, but um the story continues uh, up to the present as you will uh, see soon so the patient was what was uh, transferred uh, in a cast as you can see and he was in pain and with the scattered skin lesions he complained about pain in the in the posterior neck and in both arms and the pain increase uh, in the upright position and he has no neural deficits so this is the x-ray we took uh, with the cast still in place uh, and uh, let me let me ask the faculty uh, what can you see here Well, I, Dan should be here. I just joined in and uh, I'll make comments. Um, obviously this patient is, a, you got a cast. I can see the cast on his x-ray, which I'm not used to seeing, which is, which is interesting. But you've got this guy with a significant translational deformity. And what I mean by that is, you know, when we think of deformity, we think of uh, scoliosis and kyphosis. Um, but then if you have straightening of your neck, it's in the subaxial neck, meaning from C2, down to C7, you usually don't see it. But when you have a straightening at the cervical thoracic junction, they really get pushed forward. So there's no doubt the straightening in the, in the neck, in the subaxial neck, but you know, based on the fact this patient's so translated that they have one of two things. One, they have significant kyphosis at the cervical thoracic junction, or they have what, what I would call a subjacent deformity, meaning something like severe thoracic kyphosis or hyperkyphosis, right? Because there's some patients, as we all know, who have a neck that it's that straight, but their head is not jutted forward. So what you're seeing here is you know that there's something that's uh, lurking at the subjacent levels. The second thing I see is what looks like a very uh, a fused, you know, bamboo type spine here, right? Just just one long uh, 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 ankylosed spine, and those are my my biggest two. And the third thing I'd say is this patient's chin brow angle, the line between their forehead and their chin is almost 45 degrees and it's normal um it's normal uh, uh to be zero or or 90. it's supposed to be straight to the ground you know perpendicular to the ground this is like 45 degrees this patient is uh, is extremely disabled because they can't look at the horizon they can't look up uh, and this patient suffer as a result of that okay so yes, yes, that's uh, true. And uh, also if you follow here the spinolaminar line, and you, you, you can see that the C1, C2, um, in, in the C1, C2 level, there is a subluxation too. Would you agree with that? I agree. Great. So first thing we do we did is to remove the case the, the cast and uh, this is the um, the full spine picture showing uh, the sagittal kyphotic deformity that we usually see in AS patient when they are at an advanced stage and this is. Um, 
a volume render of the CAT scan showing now very clearly uh, both a C7 fracture and a C1, C2 uh, subluxation. Here is a closer look uh, into the fracture. And here to the C1, C2 subluxation. These are cuts of uh, thicker, uh, thicker cuts on the CT scan. So before discussing uh, what to do with the case, I will show you this MRI, which is uh, consistent with an acute C7 fracture and a perhaps a chronic C1, C2 subluxation and uh, without myelopathy in uh, neither of the affected uh, levels. And this is for discussion, which approach would you do, anterior, posterior, or maybe both? If you will approach uh, only the fracture and you will try to fix the subluxation, so what, will be your approach in this case? Well, uh, I'll go again uh, first. Um, I think you have a couple of issues that you have to balance here, right? So why is this an issue? I think part of this is an issue because this patient has slowly, slowly ankylosed their whole spine. And so the, let's go to the cervical thoracic. The cervical thoracic is a fracture that never healed, right? And, it, and it's hard to heal because it's too long, it's basically a long bone fracture, and uh, it's hard to stabilize that, and patients uh, uh, may not heal that. Granted, when they're stabilized, ang spine patients do heal their bone. They actually have quite a big turnover, so they heal their bone. So that's, that's one issue. The other issue is, was this a fracture at C1, C2, or was this really just, this was the area that was the last two ankylose, and they were using all their motion, because they're hunched forward, all their motion that was remaining was really at the skull and C1, C2. And so basically, this became a severely degenerative level, right? And so what, the reason I'm bringing this up is because when you lock those two in place, if you treat the fracture by locking it in place, and if you treat C1, C2 by locking it in place, now you're really, I mean, you're treating one problem, but you're creating another problem, which is locking this patient completely in to their position. So the question becomes, if we have to treat these C1 and 2 stability and C7 fracture, do we do a, def a simultaneous deformity correction when we do it? So maybe C1, C2, you don't get much correction at that level. Um, but at C7, maybe th that's an opportunity to help uh, translate the patient back, albeit this is a high risk, high risk type of procedure. And finally, in light of that, do while the patient's under anesthesia, do you seek to correct them anymore? And, and the reason I say this is because you're balancing the instability uh, that you want to stabilize with the fact that this patient's quality of life is terrible because they're bent, they're bent forward. And so the question is, while you're there instrumenting, do you try to approach it as not only a stabilization, but an, a realignment procedure? Those are excellent points, Dan. Uh, this is John Shin again. Um, you know, we have Wendy with us, uh, who's a neuroradiologist. Wendy, are there any um, things, that are, is there anything you can point out to us uh, from what you see from your perspective on the MRI and the CT imaging, uh, especially that C1, C2 area, the area that Dan commented on? Does that look acute to you? Does this look like chronic no. remodeling? Yeah, so the, the C1, C2, that yeah, that does not look acute, either in the osseous spine, and it doesn't look like there's any cord signal. Um, so that, that, yeah, I don't know if that was the last ankylose that's been there a long time. If they're not symptomatic from that, I, I don't know the answer. The other one does, well, the other one may or may not be acute. That might be a fluid cleft. I don't know. I didn't hear if this person came in, was this a trauma or they had been, um, in that cast for a while? That could just be a fluid cleft like osteonecrosis in the bone at that other level. Um, it doesn't really look like an acute fracture there either. But that's just from these images. 
So yeah, Dr. Zipron, did you did you say that at the beginning? I'm sorry if I missed it. Was this what what is your analysis at that lower level? Yeah, we we, uh, we at least I alluded to that. It's not my patient, okay. but I agree with you, Wendy, that I um I said that looks like an old fracture. Um, at the lower level. And I, I completely agree with you that to me that almost looks like what I would term a Charcot spine, uh, where you know a fluid collection is just levering and levering. It's like a long bone fracture that's never healing. And uh, on the MRI, the patient's in a little bit more extension. And on a CT, I think the pillows or whatever, the headrest is usually a little higher. So CTs always show people a little more kyphotic and MRIs show them. And so I, I would argue that the MRI is just opening up. And to your point, I agree with you. I think I would agree completely with you. That looks like an old, unhealed injury. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I, I, I would love to other people's opinion, but I agree with you. Yeah, is there a point? Oh, sorry. Sorry, John. It's uh, Koi Than here. Um, good to see you guys, uh, Dan. Um, so, you know, I think um, to address this uh, gentleman's fracture, uh, probably best approach from the front, um, but I uh, would agree, echo Dan's uh, sentiment that his biggest issue is his cervical deformity, the fact that he's, you know, uh, severely um, uh, cervically kyphotic and can't uh, maintain a neutral gaze. Um, I would probably address that deformity though uh, posteriorly and um, not at C7 but rather at um, the upper thoracic spine uh, just to avoid um, some of the hand uh, morbidity that can occur from doing something like a C7 PSO um, but also interested in uh, what others have to say. Hi, this is uh, Ali. Sorry I'm I'm monitoring the chat room here. I'm getting a, a lot of good questions. Uh, we're going to put our uh, second guest speaker or presenter, who John will present later. But Dan, we're going to put you on the spot. This patient is neurologically intact. He has this fracture or two fractures. It's uh, 8 p.m. When are you going to take this patient to the OR? It's 8 p.m. Uh, Friday night. And the patient status was what? Neurologically. Uh, no neuro deficit. No neurological no. deficit. Fractures. So actually, he has a, a left side radiculopathy, but nothing more than that. So, so for me, uh, in light of some of the comments I alluded to, uh, this would be potentially a very big operation. And I agree with Troy saying, hey, this be a long posterior construct with potentially a, a three column osteotomy on some level. Um, this is a first start in the morning, team, good monitoring, um, all my toys ready, uh, COVID-95 mask on, you know, the best that I can get, you know, not in the middle of the night. I just operated today on a level one with a guy who had one out of five in his legs and we did our best, right? Uh, but it was in the middle of the day. This is a deformity operation where the patient has got some radiculopathy. This is not an urgent case in my mind. In fact, uh, it takes a lot of thinking and planning. And even before, I, I thought you were going to put me on the spot, ask me exactly what I'm going to do. I would want to see that Scully film again to again plan where I think I can get it because Koi made a great point. Where am I making, ideally, if you do a three-column osteotomy, you want to make it in one place. Uh, most patients, you can do it in one place. Uh, in, a, in an angst spine, it's one of the few patients where you might need two osteotomies. Um, and so I'd want to think about that if we're addressing deformity, which I think is important. That, that's a great question. That's a great answer, Dan. But also in follow-up, another terrific question from uh, uh, one of the participants is, in these cases of AS and, and basically unstable fractures, do you feel comfortable in having them stand up for Scully films to assess for the deformity before surgery? Uh, that's a great question. I, I will tell you that, um, you know, I, I, that's a great question. I don't know the answer. I will tell you that my experience, however, has been that uh, the harm that I've seen in patients with highly unstable ang spawns have been uh, the ones who are in so much pain that they, that they splint. They don't want to move. And if you say you don't want to move, you got to be really careful. So, for example, a patient says, I'm in excruciating back pain with an unstable three column injury. And I've seen a patient brought to an MRI scanner where they, came, they went in strong and left weak. And I've seen patients uh, position prone and they lost motors when they position prone with a sublux. Um, the, uh, I haven't seen the patients get up because usually if they're that unstable, they do not want to get up there. They're in a lot of pain. I have seen other patients, however, who had a, a hairline fracture who 
came to the ER, they did not x-ray them. They went home two days later, they were in a lot of pain. They came back and there was more of a sublux. So you're right, that's a great question. There's probably at some point, they probably shouldn't be up and around. Um, uh, maybe then, uh, I, I would still see if the patient can, patient's in a ton, a ton of pain, I'd say, don't do it. If they're uh, able to, uh, to get up, then I'd try it, but very, very good point. Just as a follow-up from the radiology perspective, that's something that we've seen as well, moving them, as you said, onto the table sometimes for MRI or CT. That can be very dangerous for some of these people, as, um, as I'm sure you know. And also, I remember when I was a fellow at Barrow, we had a case where intubation was, was an issue. And so you can probably speak to that as well for how delicate these patients are and how careful you have to be with them. Yeah, and one last thing to, to your point, Wendy, I think it's a great point, is that uh, today we had this guy with a, uh, a fracture sublux and we put him in uh, traction and uh, we laid him, uh, it was a cervical, we laid him uh, uh, a supine and he reduced a lot. And my chief resident said, I think he's fully reduced. I don't think we need any weight. And I made the comment, traction is always great. It always realigns the spine. And as I say that, I go, except an egg spawn and AO dissociation, all right? Or someone who's got a skull fracture. So again, in general, uh, the traction is good. It realigns the spine. Except an egg spawn, you gotta be very careful. Except in skull fractures where you don't wanna put things into the brain. And the third one would be an AO or atlanto-occipital dissociation. So just in point, traction on egg spawn patients, to your point, Wendy, is also another concern. You start pulling this and think, the thing can shift and translate, yeah. That's great, so a lot of great points here. And I think that one of the key things is really understanding not only the, the biology of the bone, but also um, interpreting the imaging findings. So I think Wendy's input is really uh, critical here. So Nico, let's move on. What, um, what was your approach in taking care of this patient? Well, we decided to, to approach both the C1, C2, and the, and the C7. And uh, we sorry. And we did this first an anterior approach. And, and it was a tricky one because uh, in a kyphotic uh, cervical spine, uh, it may be maybe difficult to to reach the T1 to 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 put the plate. So I had to remove a little bit of of the uh, sternoclavicular uh, junction, and uh, I did a corpectomy on C7 and uh, iliac crest graft and plate, and I removed also the the posterior arc of C1 and did the uh, cranial to T2 uh, fixation. That, um, any comments? Yeah, so uh, I, think you're, you, I think it's great that you address both. I think there was, I mean, you're going to operate, I think you really should do that. Um, the question I would have is, um, is that screw in C1, is that, is that into the condyle of one? Is that on purpose or does it just look like that because it's long? No, 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 I think it's, uh, it's a mugger transarticular C1, C2, not got in it, the got condyle. It. Got it, because I was gonna say, if that's the case, I want you to teach me that because that's a pretty, pretty, pretty awesome maneuver is to go all the way to the skull from the back, that would be sweet. Um, the other question I had was the need to go to the skull Tell me about that. Was that an anchor point question where you wanted to have more anchors or was it that did you feel like he was unstable? Um, because um, it's obviously, a, a, even though it seems just one more level, obviously um, it's a big step to be occipital cervically fused because in essence this, this guy now has occipital down to, you know, tailbone, if you will. And so was that needed? Do you feel that was needed for anchors? Or did you feel like you were worried about instability occurring there, or was there already instability in your mind? Just your thought process there. I, I, uh, you mean the, the process to include the, the, the occipital bone? Yes. And the, yeah, what was your well, thing to I go to in, in this case, in this case, to my, to my knowledge, it's not a, like a fracture in another patient with, uh, without, a yes, so you have to go 
three or four level ups and two or more, three or more down. And then uh, it looks like um, to put uh, additional stress to C1, C2 in a condition with a chronic subluxation would be a problem. So right. that was my, my idea here. Okay. Nico, it looks like you got a really good, really great result with at least uh, restoring the, uh, from what we can tell on these images, the horizontal gaze here. Um, the question that I have is maybe, can you give us some insight in, in terms of how you determine your lowest uh, instrumented vertebrae there in the thoracic spine uh, in terms of stopping where you stopped versus going lower? Is there, I know it's a, it's a pretty tough question, but just in the last couple of yeah. minutes we have for this case. Is there any insight that you can provide us? Uh, yes, really in this case, because I was, uh, we have a corpectomy and a good bone graft in the anterior approach and a plate. I did only two levels down, but I'm not happy with that. I and mean, we'll probably go uh, a little bit more down. Uh, nowadays, but the, the case uh, doesn't finish here because five, year, uh, five years later, this was two or three weeks ago, during the COVID-19 crisis, he presented again with uh, this. My question, Nico, is after all these years, how did this patient find you again? Oh, the patient uh, was doing really well, was really happy. And this, uh, by the way, is two years after the surgery. And uh, here we discussed the possibility of uh, deformity correction surgery uh, down in the lumbar spine. But uh, finally, we didn't do it. And uh, so he came back to me uh, three weeks ago with this fracture. So Nico, what did you do? Did you extend them down or did you do a separate construct? I think, what, what would you do? What would you do in this case? So I think that the, the uh, point to discuss here is uh, uh, if we should go on an anterior, posterior, or both approaches, how many level ups? If we need to uh, to unite the uh, previous surgery with this new surgery, if this is finally a really good opportunity for deformity correct deformity correction. Yeah, I'll just chime in a little bit. So it, it kind of brings up the point we originally brought up: is this is this giving you a chance to improve his sub subjacent alignment a little bit? Um, the reason that I made the comment about two osteotomies is because sometimes what happens is if you don't uh, think about them, for example, we've seen some patients who've had, say, let, let me just say, if you, if you correct this where you bring his head back significantly, but you've made a pretty good chin brow angle with your OC fusion, meaning that your, your OC fusion uh, has given you some kind of chin brow angle that's good to the floor. If you correct a lot below and you pull him back, he will now be locked in looking up. So the question becomes, um, and that's why, you know, thinking about it, these are so tough because they don't give you any freedom. So I, I think probably getting some correction uh, would be reasonable. Trying to completely correct him uh, uh, is, is morbid, but it also may actually offset the chin brow angle that you set up at the top. It may put him up. So, uh, so I think I would use, use what it gives me, but not do a massive correction. All from posterior is a, is a thoracic fracture. You do not have much control in the front. You need multiple anchor points. Um, uh, post your approach only. Yeah, I'd agree with Dan. You know, this looks like it's a T12 L1 injury, so something like a, you know, T10 to L3 um, all posterior fusion. Uh, you know, to me, it doesn't uh, make a whole lot of sense to correct a uh, predominantly upper thoracic deformity with uh, work at the thoracic lumbar junction. Um, but uh, would agree that going for some a little bit uh, would, would make sense. So my idea here, I I'm agree completely. My idea is to go only for uh, from posterior and to fix this uh, inside of. 
So to to take the correction that the fracture is doing, but not to add any any more correction. And this was done uh, in the middle of the uh, COVID crisis, and, and, and it was an emergency uh, surgery. But I'm not really happy with the result, as you can see, because of the uh, here and. Uh, T12L1, there is a quite significant gap. The, the, the question that comes up, I mean, this happens with uh, what, what you call, you know, for people on listening, we call these opening wedge osteotomies, right? As opposed to closing wedge osteotomies where you make a triangle and close it. Uh, this is an opening wedge osteotomy where you cut and, you, and you're levering really in the middle column. So what happens in these is angspon can heal uh, if the posterior decompression, if you did any, was not too much. So if you have a big gap, gap in the front um, and you have bone on bone in the back, you might be fine. If you have a big gap in the front and you've done a wide laminectomy with any facetectomy, then you might be concerned that you have to fill that. Um, but if there's bone hitting in the back, you may be okay with that. Um, but obviously, uh, to fill that front, you'd have to do a thoracotomy uh, or, or an extracavitary approach uh, from the back. So um, which are which are reasonable, but I would say if you have bone on bone in the back and the screws are macho with that cement, um, you might be covered and it might heal in the back. Yes, uh, I'm not sure, but I put the patient in a brace and uh, I, 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 I present the case to, to complete the surgery with a mini open anterior approach to put something in the gap that uh, this patient was not pri prioritized in the because of the COVID problem. So he is uh, currently home with a brace, and uh, now I, I will propose uh, to complete the surgery with something uh, from the front. And and just a, just a kind of learning point for me that I've experienced in the past is that. If you want to fuse an angst spawn in situ, meaning that you do not want to do a deformity correction, I find that naturally with angst spawn, they are often very uh, uh, globally kyphotic. Putting them on, a, Wils on a, um, a Wilson frame or some kind of uh, 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 a kyphotic type frame is safer because if you put them on a Jackson, they can fish mouth and translate. However, if you want to have a significant deformity reduction, then you can put them on a Jackson. One thing that you can do in between is you can put them on a Wilson frame and then in the, in the operation, you can crank down the Wilson frame and let them sink into more uh, 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 lordosis, if you will, and that way control the, uh, the spread. That's something I've experienced because I've learned. I had a spawn uh, L5, L4 once, and I saw a sublux on a Jackson with a big fish mouth, and it was very hard to control in the back. That was years ago, and I learned that trick. So, so Nico, you said that you did that anterior approach, or you're, you're planning to do it? No, I'm planning to do it. You're I'm planning, planning to, to do, do it. it. Okay. As soon as possible. 